Hi, Mary Jo. How are you? How are you? Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. My dog may join us periodically. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> we're just uh, going to have uh, Shannon will join us here in a second. OK. Um, I was thinking, uh, do you want to introduce Beth since uh, she has had a long term affiliation with Audubon? Um, you know what? I'm really pretty new. I've only been okay. with Audubon for about four or five months and, you know, pro have never met Beth. Okay. So, um, yeah, I would be less okay. than optimal to inter introduce her. Okay. Well, we'll see if Shannon as a co-sponsor wants to do it as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so what I have for you, so I've got a couple of slides from Shannon that uh, when I give an introduction to One Health, I'll go to Shannon. She can talk a little bit about uh, Heritage Conservancy. Okay. Then uh, we'll go to uh, the slide that I have of uh, Bucks County Audubon Society. So it's just kind of a a mission and logo page. And so right. that you can talk about uh, Bucks County um, and then we'll go into the introduction. Either I'll give Shannon an opportunity to do the introduction or I'll okay. do the introduction. And then uh, Beth will take over from there and uh, we'll, we'll all go on to, you know, closing down our, 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 mute. our videos okay. and muting right. our, and uh, at the end, we'll be asking for people to do Q&A, to type in Q&A. Okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and ask those questions of Beth. And of course, you know, you're more than welcome to kick in and say, hey, I got a question for you, too. OK, uh, OK. Um, uh, well, I did. Um, I, and that's, uh, this, I'm glad we were able to get together beforehand because I wanted to ask you if um, I could talk a little bit about our inventory project. Sure, sure. Yeah, I would just like to 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 sort of introduce what we're doing, and it's it's pretty, it's unique, um, and we're really fortunate that we have records of what was going on in the Honey Hollow watershed, soil, water, temperature, flora, fauna microinvertebrates, the whole gamut, um, 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And we're looking at that again now. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was the only thing, you know, because um, as I said, I'm new and um, I'm not an environmentalist by training, only by passion. <laughs> so I, I thought that this would be a good thing to, uh, you know, just to kind of talk about where we are when it comes to looking at watersheds and water quality kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can also mention if you wanted to, uh, most of the people that are going to be on tonight are going to be students. And so okay. if you just wanted to say that, you know, there are internship opportunities uh, at Bucks County Audubon Society, and they can contact you if, if they're interested. Okay. All right. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Hello. How are you? It's nice to meet you, Mary Jo. And it's nice to meet you. I think I'm going to take my glasses off. There's that awful, I need one of those fancy ring lights. Uh, <laughs> and I was explaining to Reg that my dog may join us as well. <laughs> Yeah, one of my cats is roaming around and the dog's out there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what happens to me is I've got two cats and one of them weighs about 3,000 pounds. Pounds, right. And she will jump up onto my desk and then suddenly everything on the desk will disappear <laughs> off the other side. <laughs> right. Uh, so if you hear a loud crash and I fall out of my chair or something, yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's probably her. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, my cat is is getting adept at sending emails. Uh, every once in a while, I'll walk by, and he's got he's walking across the keys, yeah. and there's all kinds of things popping up on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, that happens to my wife a lot. 
So Shannon, I hear that our president is going to be meeting with your president here pretty soon. <laughs> I hear that same rumor, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so I got an email from my dean saying, do you know about anything happening with the Heritage Conservancy? <laughs> and I said, absolutely not. We've really had nothing to do with the Heritage Conservancy ever. <laughs> Yeah, it was so funny. I got the message that they were going to meet next week. And oh, could you make sure to fill in our new president, you know, on <laughs> our history with with Del Val. And, you know, it's just so funny. I was trying to think back and I was like, well, you were literally one of the first people I met when I moved out here, even before I started working at Heritage Conservancy. We went met in Philadelphia at the was it one of the it was ASM, the wasn't it? ASM conference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, and then I started working at Heritage and we started, you know, kind of chatting from there. And I was trying to, when did the Delval One House start? In 2015. Okay. So we didn't come in around, I think until like 2018, I think was the first one I remembered seeing in my notes. Yeah, so. I, I would have a hard time getting it down to that. My actual <laughs> involvement with Heritage Conservancy dates back to probably the late 1990s right right because you did the bat counts at I the, did the, the bat church stuff, right and i also helped to paint mm -hmm. the the bat gates at uh, durham mine <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> we might need you up there again they might need a fresh coat of paint <laughs> just let me know i'll see if i can drag a bunch of students up there too right right yeah i forgot about some of the bat count stuff too yeah and my involvement, Mary Jo, with uh, Bucks County Audubon Society dates back to when I started with Del Val, which was probably 2005, was probably oh, the okay. first. So, so I have at least had had some contact with both of your organizations for quite some time, maybe in different capacities, but um, yeah, so well, I, I, it's, I'm sorry, it's go interesting. ahead. It's interesting, oh, sorry, it, it's interesting that I actually was the development director for Bucks Audubon. And I, I calculate that by my youngest child was five and he's now 25. So I guess that means that about 20 years ago, I was the development director for about three or four years um, and then came back on the board in 2010 briefly for two years and then just recently uh, became the executive director. So it's a little bit like coming home for me. <laughs> yeah, and I think our time then I was on the board, I was trying to remember, I was over at Audubon for the board for, I think I stepped off last year and it was about four years before that, that I was oh, okay. had started right. on there. So okay. yeah, so we missed well, each other by a little bit there. <laughs> by a little bit, but yeah. Um, so you have a lot of history with with Audubon, so that's great. Yeah, and yep. and I had been on the board as well for oh, okay uh, for a couple of years anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't know Mary Jo if you've had the chance to meet our new president Bill Kunze yet. I'm sure you've worked with Jeff Marshall a bit. <laughs> yes, um, and, but no, I haven't met your new president. Mm -hmm. I would really like to. So, yeah, that would be great, you know, because there's also just a long history between our two organizations, organizations absolutely. because yeah. Tinicum or um, um, Tuckamone next door, yeah. we own, but there's life rights and then another conservation easement organization, you know, Bucks, um, Land Trust of Bucks County that has the right. easement on it. It's a lot of layers there. Yes. And then, you know, we hold the easement at, easement at the on, Audubon property. On, on Audubon property. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. As yeah. a matter of fact, I recently worked with Mary Lou. Yep. Uh huh. She um, might be yep. on the call tonight too. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Well, she and I also share. Um, we both are on the Architecture and Environment Committee for the Central Bucks Chamber. Yeah. So, um, but uh, she recently came out and walked around the property and yeah. gave us a good report. Good, good. Yeah, she does, especially with the historic buildings. That's, you know, a big part yes. of her niche. So right. yeah, right. Yeah, she was going to try and join in on the audience tonight. She tries to jump on when she can. <laughs> okay. Cool. So at the at the time that I last looked at it, we had 65 people that were, okay. were, were scheduled for or had reservations anyway. Okay. 
Sorry, I was just making sure I hadn't hadn't got anything from Beth. There's one that, cat. <laughs> oh, there's one cat. <laughs> hi, kitty. Well, hi there. <laughs> That's a big cat. Yeah, and she's actually was the smallest in her litter because. Uh, oh my gosh. She was our bottle baby. We raised her from when she could fit into my hand. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, our cat used to be quite pudgy, <laughs> um, but he's developed um, hyperthyroidism. Oh. So he eats all the time. He's constantly hungry and, um, um, and has lost weight, but he's still, you know, he still looks good. And, you know, he's mm-hmm. actually, he's at the weight he should be. <laughs> right. He's not pudgy anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna drop an email here and make sure that Beth isn't having any problems. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. Mm-hmm. So everyone's doing well over at Audubon. Yes, you know it's it's been. It's been an interesting journey. Um, I've, um, I'm learning all the time. Uh, you know, uh, Stacy did a wonderful job, but she was trying to run the organization from Montana for about a year. Right, right. So it's a lot of, you know, catching up. And I also find that now people have someone to go to. So I get dozens of emails, questions, and I was like, okay. okay wait, I have to manage this. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Do you know Diane? Yeah, Smith? Diane Smith. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Yep. And uh, I guess Molly Bell came on right after, right before. Right. Left, yeah. I've- so She's only been. I had at least met her a little bit because my my two sons have gone to summer camp there the last week. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, the camps have really taken off, especially the school holiday camps. Right. We've been filling up um, pretty much all that we the last two, and then we're already filling up for. And I don't know what what holidays there. I mean, obviously, they're the obvious ones, but there's right. like, I think, um, October 24th. Is that yeah, it's, it's a Hindu. Um, it's Diwali. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's the, the right, Festival Denali. of Lights. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, they've been going really well. Yeah, definitely. There's a huge need for that, for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember when my kids were school age, I was desperate. <laughs> right. Yep. You know, trying to patch it together. My husband and I were trying to juggle who would be home and. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, we're in the same boat. We don't have any family that lives locally. So for us, right. we have a 10 year old and a six year old. So it's always. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, so I just heard from uh, Beth. She is on her way, so. Okay. Okay. Good. The impending stroke I was going to have has passed. So. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shannon, I, uh, I, I just told my dean to tell the president that, uh, actually, why is that recording? Let's try that. Does that show recording now, Shannon? Okay, good. Yeah, for some reason it was recording our our practice session, which I didn't really want. All right, so uh, back to One Health. So again, this is our fourth One Health seminar. Thank you all so much for being here. Just a really brief introduction to One Health. Essentially, One Health just indicates that, well, it recognizes the fact, guess what? There's only one planet. And we all are dependent upon this planet, whether we're talking about humans, whether we're talking about animals or the environment, we're all in this together. We're inextricably linked. And I think that the sooner we recognize that, uh, the better off we're gonna be. Uh, that you know, whatever impacts the environment ultimately may impact us as well, and not necessarily in a good way. Uh, and so 
approaching these problems. And many of our One Health seminars are talking about different problems or talking about these interactions. Uh, and the intent here is that it be something that kind of makes us all think, hey, wait a minute, I didn't know about that and I don't really have the expertise for that. Maybe I need to talk to somebody else who can help out. And that's the whole idea behind transdisciplinary approaches to the problems that we face at a local level all the way up to a, the global level. Uh, so One Health at DelVal really is based on three different components. One is education. And so we start out right with our first year students, introducing them to the concept of One Health. And then many of our courses throughout, uh, my courses in particular, wildlife management has always been based on that connection between people, the environment and animals. So that's kind of an easy one for my area, uh, but we're trying to get this across all of our departments. And, and at the moment, we're working on the idea of developing a One Health communications minor. Uh, we have a, a planning grant from uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, so that may be something for you students who are on the line be uh, thinking about in the future. We'd also like to see a lot more research in which across different disciplines, DelVal is small enough that we really don't have those uh, silos that we see at very large universities in which, you know, oh, you're in this department, I don't talk to you. Uh, we all can talk to each other and we need to talk together and work together. And then a final component of this is outreach. And certainly the One Health seminar uh, series is meant to be an outreach. Uh, and another component of our outreach, which is coming up, is that the first week of November, on November 3rd, is identified as World One Health Day. Well, here at Del Val, we celebrate the whole week. You know, why just celebrate one day? It's kind of like birthdays. Why make it one day when you can make it the whole week? And so during that time, we're going to have a milkshake truck. We're going to have games. We've got competitions. We've got a mock disease outbreak that you can participate in. We've got all kinds of stuff happening. So be looking for all of that that's going to be coming your way. So without further ado, I am now going to move to our co-sponsors for this evening. And these are not one-time co-sponsors. These are co-sponsors that have been with us for a long time. So first up here is Heritage Conservancy. And we're very happy to have Shannon Freidebaum Siller here with us the evening. And Shannon um, wants to tell you a little bit about uh, Heritage Conservancy. Thank you so much, Reg and Del Val for having me here tonight. I'm Shannon Friedevoss Siller, and as Reg mentioned, with Heritage Conservancy. Um, and Reg, I don't know if you could advance to our slide for me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. You're oh. not seeing that now? No. Ooh, that's bizarre. <laughs> How about now? No. On my screen, it's showing Bucks County. Hmm, it's not showing on my screen. Are you seeing One Health now? Seeing One Health. But you're not seeing your slide now. No. That is weird. That is peculiar. Uh, <laughs> they're all in the same slide person. <laughs> and so you're not seeing Bucks County here either. No. Well, I apologize, but I don't know what to do about this. That's OK. I will just share with you <laughs> the words that I have prepared. And you can imagine the things in your mind. <laughs> So um, at Heritage Conservancy, we work to protect land and historic places. And since 1958, we've helped to preserve over 16,000 acres of open space, farmland, wildlife habitat, and important watershed areas throughout the region. And each year we host over 100 volunteer community and educational programs. And so there's a variety of ways that, you know, tonight's topic about our shared waters is really important in our conversations and our work at Heritage Conservancy. So we are working to help to protect the Delaware River watershed through our land preservation efforts and through a lot of our um, programs and activities on our properties, including native tree plantings along riparian areas and working to help you know, keep trash out of the environment, which is either washed in from flooding or rain, dumped there, left by visitors and all of those pieces. 
And, you know, the concept of a watershed or a river basin is, is a lot to grasp and fathom. Um, but that's exactly what we talk about in some of our programming that we do with people of all ages, but especially with students. And just recently, we piloted a brand new cross watershed collaboration program with fourth graders from an upstream and a downstream school. And through the magic of, you know, video calls, we were able to have the students learn about watersheds, learn about how their um, you know, potential impacts on the watershed and how they're connected through the land and the water that we're all using. So um, it was a really great way to get them to start to understand that, you know, we are all sharing this water and land together and to look beyond, you know, their local area um, as, as part of that educational experience. So um, please feel free to visit heritageconservancy.org. I'll put um, a link to our events page on um, in the chat. And it has some upcoming events, um, some tree plantings, a wildlife program coming up, and a lot of other you know, fun things for the fall season. And with that, um, I'm delighted to pass this over to Mary Jo with Bucks County Audubon Society. Unmute. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Shannon, thank you, Rich. Thank you to DelVal for um, inviting me to say a few words about Bucks County Audubon. Uh, we are located at the Honey Hollow on the Honey Hollow watershed on a property that um, Heritage Conservancy owns the uh, the conservation easement for. And we have a wonderful facility, um, a beautiful old barn that we use as our visitor center and the education center. But I just wanted to mention something briefly uh, about an exciting project that we have in the works. In 1972, uh, some very dedicated volunteers put together an inventory of all the flora, fauna, the water, uh, everything from microinvertebrates to mink, uh, and, um, and also monitoring climate and temperature. Another group of dedicated volunteers has now um, undertaken an update 50 years later of that inventory. And we're already getting some pretty remarkable results. Uh, there's a uh, <clears throat> things like you know, a lot of the the uh, uh, the flora and fauna have changed, um, but one of the things that was pretty startling is we saw a 3.5 to 4 degree temperature difference. It from 1972, they were tracking all the you know the the NOAA data, and the temperature has increased by three and a half to 4%, which is larger than the global average increase. So a lot of, a lot of impact. Uh, so we're gonna be producing those results probably mid-year next year. So, um, but we would love to have anyone who's interested to come volunteer, uh, be an intern. Uh, we're located on Creamery Road in Solberry, and it's a great place. We've got seven miles of trails that are open dawn to dusk. We'd love to have you come out and visit. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, and thank you, Shannon. My apologies for the uh, PowerPoint, for some reason, not going to your slides. Uh, we were talking about flying by the seat of the pants earlier. There's a great example we have to do. <laughs> Who knows what's going on? Well, I'm very pleased to be introducing our guest this evening, uh, Beth Brown. And if you forgive me, I will be reading this from the flyer here. But uh, Beth was is Director of External Affairs and Communications for the Delaware River Basin Commission. This is a federal interstate uh, agency created in 1961. Uh, by legislation and by uh, President Kennedy and the governors of the four basin states. So this is a pretty important thing. It's a recognition of just how important this river uh, is to a number of different states and how important it is nationally as well. She's responsible for developing and maintaining and leveraging uh, DRBC relationships with key stakeholders. Uh, and I think actually all of us that are on here tonight are among those stakeholders, uh, as well as development with uh, an implementation of the commission's external and internal communications and outreach strategy and objectives. 
I think every single one of our organizations are members of our shared waters, if I remember correctly. Uh, Beth brings over 15 years of experience and depth of knowledge about the river basin and the environmental field uh, to her role. Uh, recently, she led the National Audubon Society Delaware River Watershed Program. This was based out of Philadelphia, uh, but it was working throughout the basin. And the program brings together public policy on the ground uh, conservation projects and community engagement, kind of essential. Audubon, uh, at Audubon, Ber uh, Beth served as the DRBC's advisory committee on climate change and monitoring advisory and coordination committee, uh, advised Drexel's climate research agenda, drove the creation of the Delaware River Watershed Congressional Caucus. And here's probably the most important thing to me, led the growth of the Audubon Brewers for the Delaware River. This is absolutely an essential element of this activity. I'm all for it. Uh, and, <laughs> and lent a key voice to the US Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, new Delaware River Watershed Conservation Collaborative. So pleased to have you with us tonight, Beth. Uh, and for all of you, keep in mind that as you think of them, you can put your questions into Q&A. Uh, and it's all yours, Beth. Great. Thank you so much, Reg, Mary Jo, and Shannon. Um, I feel like half of my presentation was already covered with all of these great introductions and explaining partnerships. Um, it's so true what Shannon, Mary Jo, and Reg said about we can't do our work alone. We can't work in silos. And I think if you take one thing away from my remarks tonight is that as you know, big and collaborative as our organization, our commission is, we're not doing everything. We, we couldn't possibly tackle all the problems of people, environment, animals. And so we, by necessity, have to you know, work together across disciplines, across specialties. You know, we don't plant trees, but Shannon's organization does. We don't inventory birds, but we manage the water quality and the, you know, monitor the, the water chemistry that the, the fish need in order to be there for the birds to eat. So there's so many interconnections between the organizations. And I think part of the joy of learning in, in a university setting is, is, is starting to understand those connections. But I will tell you, it can be a lifelong joy. And it has certainly for me. Um, some, of the, some of the projects and, and topics that Reg mentioned in the introduction, I mean, those are across so many different disciplines and, and so much of the, of the passion that I feel comes from finding those connections across places where you might not think of them. Um, so with that uh, sort of opening opening thought from Beth, I will go ahead and share my um, my slides and we'll we'll get into things a little bit here. All right, so we've got a couple of photos here from the aerial view of the river and just getting into things. We've got a lot to talk about and we'll start with what is a basin? It's right in our name, but a lot of people don't know what the word river basin means, the term river basin, or the term watershed. And so we can start with some definitions and some, some basic ideas. So the concept of a river basin or a watershed, they're fairly interchangeable, is the area of land that ultimately drains to a body of water. In this case, the Delaware River 
is a major river of the United States and of the world. And so major drainage basins, major rivers have drainage basins. And so we're called the Delaware River Basin Commission. And what's unique about us is that we're based on nature. We're not based on political boundaries or, you know, what people live where. We're based on the way a natural system functions. And that's really unusual for a government or a scientific body to function. Uh, but it is really effective for us because it allows the DRBC to work in a way that no one state or entity could do by itself. So pulling back a little bit, um, you can see in the map here, there's a bunch of different colors. So I'll just go through and, and describe what's up on the slide here. So on the right side of the slide, we've got a map of the Delaware River Basin. So all the area of land that ultimately drains to the Delaware River encompasses part of Pennsylvania. That's the part that's in sort of light pink on the left side part of Western New Jersey, and that's shown in green. And then at the top of the river basin is New York State. Uh, the Catskill Mountains roughly are where the Delaware River begins, begins in two separate branches up in the mountains, sort of comes out of nothing, really sort of like these tiny little capillary streams eventually form the east and west branches of the Delaware River. And then at Hancock, New York, they come together and form the main stem Delaware River. So that that main stretch of river sort of between between there and all the way down to Delaware Bay, uh, flowing then in past the, the great state of Delaware and into the Atlantic Ocean. So just to sort of orient you there, we're you know within the mid-Atlantic. So Delaware Valley University is in the Delaware River watershed, Delaware River Basin. Um, the organizations that are that are here tonight, Bucks County Audubon, Heritage Conservancy, they're physically located within the basin. And all of our work and all the partnerships that, that we have function because of this interconnectedness. But it's not just us, right? Not just us in this room. Every one of the people in this room, and unless you're zooming in from somewhere else in the world, if you're zooming in locally, you're, you're most likely living in the Delaware River Basin. And you're not alone. 13.3 million people are served by the Delaware River and its water. So that includes everyone who lives in Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington, Trenton, Allentown, some of the other larger cities that are physically in the basin. And then to make things even more complicated, there are a number of people living in New York City that is not in the watershed or the basin that drink water that comes from the Delaware. So back in the early part of the last century, there were a, a few drinking water reservoirs that were built up in those headwaters on the east and west branches. And those serve over 5 million people in New York City with drinking water. And so together, that's over 13 million people that rely on this one river. And that's almost 4% of the United States population, which is a mind boggling number for me, even today, as I sit here. Um, and so there are over 2000 tributaries. If we think about governments and decision making at a local level, there's over 860 local governments within our basin. Just the main river alone is 330 miles. And as I mentioned, it in includes parts of four different states. So that's a lot of potential for chaos is how, how it really was shaping up uh, back before there was a Delaware River Basin Commission. And so why, why were we formed, right? What, what's the need and what's the purpose uh, and what's to be gained from taking states and you know, shifting the focus around to a natural system and, and looking at water resources from a watershed perspective. Well, before DRBC was formed in the 1960s, there were some tremendous water supply 
disputes, um, so much so that states were suing each other over how much water each one could use. That's a big problem. It's an expensive problem, and it leads to uncertainty, and it leads to health issues, enjoyment issues, economic issues. And so that's a major issue that went to the Supreme Court, not once, but twice. And the Supreme Court said, hey, look, you know, you, you guys need to figure something out there. We're going to have, you know, a settlement and a decree and there's going to be some arrangements here. But that was in the background and it was very much of the time where states were thinking maybe there's a better way you know maybe there's a way that we can avoid costly and lengthy you know lawsuits and litigation um added to this the water quality was really poor back in the 1940s 50s and leading into 1961 when the drbc was formed the stretch of river that runs through our most populated and populous areas through Philadelphia, Camden, Wilmington, it smelled, it turned ships a different color when they sailed through, and it was killing fish. Fish could not live in that stretch of the river, and many fish who need to migrate and pass through the stretch of the river weren't making it, um, which has a devastating impact on the entire ecosystem. And so add to that floods and droughts and all of these disjointed and, and un, unorganized municipal, local, state governments, it was a huge mess. And so with that backdrop, in 1961, the four states and the federal government joined together and each state passed a state law and the federal government passed a federal law and together it formed the Delaware River Basin Compact so that our organization has the power of both state and federal law, which is totally awesome and really unusual. And it was really in recognition that you know, the Delaware is our founding waters, it's our shared watershed, and it's a national treasure that we need to start treating like one. And so in 1961, we were formed. That was before the Clean Water Act. Uh, you may have heard just this week was the 50th anniversary of the Federal Clean Water Act, which has done so much to clean up uh, rivers and water throughout the United States. Uh, but the Delaware actually had a head start because the DRBC was working, you know, a few years even before the 1972 federal law was passed. We were started in 1961. So we actually just uh, celebrated our 60th anniversary um, last year. So that's the why, that's why we started and we're still here and we're still needed. We're needed in fact more than ever. Um, and I'll get into the why we're still relevant and what challenges we face today in just a moment. But just to focus in on sort of the government side of things um, because it is really, really interesting to note. So our staff of scientists, planners and other professionals we answer to essentially a, a, a number of bosses, right? Our five equal members are made up of the governors of the four basin states, plus a representative of the federal government. And usually these, governor, these commissioners that, that make decisions, usually they act unanimously, um, not always, but usually. And so to find common ground across, you know, different states, different sometimes political parties, different, you know, agendas and, and priorities in the various states and regions is a tremendous success story and a model for other places. So there are only a few other commissions like ours in the country. The Susquehanna River Basin Commission is right next door to us. They're similar in some ways, different in others. Um, and like right now, there's a major dispute over the use of water in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. And there's many people that are suggesting that if they had something like the DRBC, they would be in a lot 
better position to manage water among those states. Certainly we're seeing in the Western United States, you may have heard of the mega drought that's happening on the Colorado River. Um, and you know, certainly there are some plans and, and coordination in place there, but nothing like the DRBC. And so, you know, when we think about if we were ever to face a mega drought, right, lasting for years and years, we have this great planning framework and, and tool in place to really be ready for whatever, you know, nature throws our way. So what do we do? And how do we do it? So our mission at its core is to manage, protect, and improve the basin's water resources. Uh, and we do this by focusing on four main areas, water quality, water availability, equity, and resiliency. These are really our cornerstones of everything that we do. So sometimes we shorthand, we say we manage water quality and quantity, how much and how clean, right? Um, but it really is more nuanced than that. And it's it's much more involved. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, from the 1960s on, we've been around steered by the governors and the United States of um, America's federal representative. And we meet, they meet quarterly to provide direction and make decisions on important water quality and quantity issues. And as I mentioned, one of the major things that we do is we export water to those residents of New York City from the drinking water reservoirs in the upper basin, as well as parts of New Jersey from the uh, Delaware and Raritan Canal. Um, there's sort of a, an offshoot of, of Delaware River water that serves some customers in New Jersey that don't live in the basin. So our staff is doing all this work. We provide analysis, Increasingly, we're working with highly sophisticated 3D computer modeling that allows us to run different scenarios of future conditions, right? If we change temperature or we change um, salinity or we change the, you know, the amount of inputs from a certain discharge, what does that do to water quality, right? In a very broad sense, like trying to predict what the impact of our regulatory role or our, you know, sort of oversight role might be. That's hugely important and it takes a lot of really smart people who, you know, went to college, who, you know, really are dedicated to um, putting the best science and the best engineering and study in, into the world to really apply it to these very real, very present problems. Um, in addition to sort of that, that forecasting and modeling, we have actual need to monitor and measure what's happening on the ground at any time in our basin today. So that can be anything from how much dissolved oxygen is in the water to toxics that are currently regulated, something like PCBs that have been around and have been known about for a long time to new and emerging contaminants like PFOS or PFOS or PFOA. You may have heard of these different um, acronyms. These are uh, sort of less well studied, but increasingly, um, increasingly known to be pervasive. I think just this week there's a new study out that says something like 83, 82% of waters in the United States have some presence of PFAS in them, which is incredible. What does that do for health, right? For animals, people, health. Um, so understanding where those um, less regulated or newer emerging contaminants are and looking at other conditions, temperature, salinity, these all uh, come together to make up what we call water quality, right? Water quality isn't just one thing, either good or bad, right? It's a range of conditions that can change over time or can be impacted by various seasonal, uh, tidal, other, other situations. Some of our staff 
are more on the planning side. So to take one example, we recently put out a report that tried to predict how much water would be used by everyone in the basin, everyone who uses water from the Delaware, companies like electric generating stations, nuclear generating stations, uh, agricultural operations, everyone living in homes and apartments in the basin, businesses, offices, other water users like that. And we found that because of the changes in the way we're generating electricity and because of the increase in efficiency that we think there's a really good chance that we've already used the most water that we'll use for the next 60 years, that like our peak of water use has already happened and that we'll actually need to use less water even though our population is growing overall um, because of some of these factors. So just understanding that as like a baseline to make other decisions and to plan for, you know, what constitutes a drought and how do we respond to different, you know, natural conditions is really critically important. Um, and then our agency also has a regulatory role, which means that we have an obligation and an authority to determine what can and can't happen to some degree within the basin that impacts water resources. So if something has the potential to have a significant impact on the water resources of our basin, we can, we can regulate it. And so that sometimes takes the form of a permit, which we call dockets. And we issue those dockets to um, entities that want to discharge a certain amount of water or discharge certain chemicals into the water or entities that need to withdraw water to use it and eventually put it back or use it and not put it back, consumptively use it, like whether it goes up into the atmosphere um, or it gets applied to land in some way and, and doesn't ultimately end up making it back into the water system. Um, so that's another component and sort of the, the career path of some of our staff members. And that's really important too, because that means that for every permit we issue, there's a company or there's an entity on the other side of that permit that is responsible to uphold the conditions of the permit. That's what we call our regulated community. Um, and so we have a really great relationship with the entities that we regulate. You know, we certainly work we think we work very collaboratively with them to understand what their needs are and how we can all work together to achieve, you know, a, a shared a shared goal and a shared purpose. That said, we do do things like another agency might do. We can collect fees for our permits. We can, you know, sometimes in the very unlikely situation that that there's a violation of a permit, we can enforce the terms, we can, you know, issue penalties and other things like that. But these are all the different jobs and roles and responsibilities that make up you know, being the DRBC. Um, and that's just in the science sort of side of things. Um, and so all of that with less than 40 people, and we have an office in West Trenton, New Jersey, um, and, and that's sort of who we are. So we're working in all of these different areas um, and trying to create something that's bigger than, bigger than just the, the 39 of us working, right? And as I said at the outset, we do that by partnerships with our regulated community, with environmental organizations, conservation groups, and other partners. And that's where, you know, we come up with this idea of our shared waters, right? We can't do it all alone. And so when we think about just looking at this top left quadrant of water quality, you know, we can look and we can monitor for pollution and water quality in different ways and different places, but we can't even cover the whole watershed. So sometimes we look to our partners at the state to 
monitor, for example, a small tributary stream to make sure that it's, you know, still meeting the, the high quality water that we last checked it at, right? Um, or the healthy habitats, right? We look to like the Bucks County Audubon Society and the Heritage Conservancy and groups like them working throughout the watershed. And increasingly working with the Fish and Wildlife Service on this amazing program that's providing funding for conservation projects that's increasing habitat that we know does double duty, right? It's not just planting a tree because a bird needs it. It's planting a tree alongside a stream because we know that's a natural way to slow down runoff, to filter pollution and, and silt and other factors that can negatively affect water quality. And so we know that if we can do that working together, we know where the streams are that need those projects the most, everybody wins, right? It's less that we have to fix and more nature and more habitat, and that's all for the good. Um, so the part of the the part of my role that I really get to focus on, um, actually, before I jump into that, let me say one more thing about, you know, what we do and how we work. So in the water resiliency quadrant here is climate change, right? That's something that when I was going through school and getting into the environmental field, I was actually discouraged from going into the environmental field. Everybody said to me, that's all been done. It's all been taken care of. You know, we have the Clean Water Act, you know, ho-hum, like everything's getting cleaned up. That was like a thing in the 70s. Nobody's really doing that anymore. And then along came this awareness and, and really stark awareness and, and understanding of climate change and its impacts. And I've heard climate change described this way. So climate is the shark and water is the teeth. So we know that climate change is showing up in our lives as a water issue, right? It's showing up as a water issue because we're having more severe storms, we're having more erratic weather patterns, we're having sea level rise, um, we're having droughts, right? In different different degrees, that can be, um, you know, a, a sign and a symptom of, of a changing climate and so many more um, issues. But, but at the core, all of those are water issues. And so working in a water resources organization is inherently needing to think about climate change and all the many ways that it shows up. So just to take one example, um, some of our work and some of our staff focus really specifically and in a very dedicated way on understanding when the when water flows downstream in the river, how much force does that exert on salt water that pushes up from the ocean and where that line or that front, as we call it, a salt front, where that salt front exists, where the river eventually switches over from being considered freshwater to salt water, that has a major impact because if that salt front moves up too far, it can impact drinking water intakes, it can impact industrial facilities and processes, it can have an impact on people's health if you're drinking water that's too salty. It might not taste like seawater, but it can still be, you know, so salty that it has like a deleterious impact on, on some of our, our more vulnerable um, members of communities. And so that's a real impact that Every day somebody is thinking about, somebody is modeling, monitoring, and thinking about ways to manage it today and into the future so that when, you know, our future generations are still wanting to live in the same places that we live and, and thrive today, that that's possible. Um, and so with that, I just want to focus a little bit more from a little bit of a career perspective, but also thinking about this our shared waters concept and the partnership. 
what I focus on a lot in my role is this in the water equity and sort of the stakeholder thought is public access and information, right? So who are our stakeholders? As I mentioned, some of our stakeholders are the regulated community. Some of our stakeholders are our partner organizations with whom we share data, with whom we rely on for um, projects on the ground, restoration projects that enhance the health of our watershed. And really at the end of the day, it's everyone who lives, works, plays, enjoys the basin. Everybody belongs in this basin. And my role and my privilege is to be able to share the wonders of our basin with our partners and with our elected officials in the hopes that our policymakers and our elected officials really understand and support our work. So through our shared waters, which really we think of as a, this wrapper, right, for our outreach efforts, We've been able to meet with over 80 different legislators and really educate them on what the Delaware River Basin is, why it's so vital to our nation as a, as a historic you know, proposition, as a recreation proposition, as an, as an economic engine, and, and so much more. Um, because baseball has such a strong connection to the Delaware River, which you may or may not know about. And I can share a little bit more on that later if there's time. We've specifically gone into baseball games and stadiums and talked to fans about how every baseball in the major leagues is mudded, which means it's roughed up with mud that comes from the Delaware River. And so that's a really cool way that the river can be an ambassador, you know, and baseball can be an ambassador for something that has, you know, logically nothing to do with water resources. And we've provided uh, support for first time paddlers in, from environmental justice communities and other areas to enjoy the river and experience and, and access the, the wonderful thing that is the sojourn experience. So on the Lehigh, the Schuylkill, and the main Delaware River, every year there's a multi-day paddle called a sojourn, and we've been able to support more people, more diverse audiences getting involved with that. So just some of the things that we've done um, on the left side, you'll also see that's a, a, a snapshot where we took a state legislator out on a bird walk. Um, we did the same thing actually at the Bucks County Audubon Society um, at the at the Nature Center there with some other some other folks that we did that last year and that was a ton of fun. Um, we do some cleanups with our partners that do that on a more regular basis and so on. So that's a really vital thing that. We can't be everywhere at all times. Every, every organization we partner with has a, such a great specialty and specialized knowledge, whether it's geographic specialty or you know, specializing in birds or something else that relates to the water. And so it's just fantastic to be able to get out there and do that. Another part of my job that's really exciting is to be able to talk about the great work that my colleagues do, the great work that the commission does to manage and protect the river. So some real quick examples of this are earned media. What does that mean? That means when we talk about something and someone notices, right? It does. It means that we didn't write about it, someone else did. So this is a great example. I have a snapshot here where we put out a study just this year, just this summer on microplastics and somebody wrote about it, right? The Philadelphia Inquirer took notice and said, hey, this is, this is worth covering. Um, published blogs. So our shared waters partners have the opportunity to share their personal connections to the river, work that they've done that, that highlights the importance of the river and partnerships. And so that's something if, um, you know, if if you're wanting to read more about who we are and how we work throughout the, the basin, I encourage you to take a look at that. 
And we also put out some videos and we have a, a thriving Facebook community that's really just all part of sharing the great work and awareness um, around the Delaware River Basin. So I'm going to try to share this video, but if it doesn't work, I'll put the link in the chat. But let me know if you're hearing it. We're not hearing it, Beth. Okay. I had a feeling that might be problematic. Um, okay, so essentially what this is, and I'll, I'll skip over this, but this is just a real quick clip that is highlighting one of our staff members, an aquatic biologist, who is showing um, the methodology for a very specific type of water quality sampling that is based on doing a survey of what type of aquatic insects are living in the water. It's called macroinvertebrate surveying. Uh, you may have heard of it. So basically it means that if I take a scoop of the water and there's a suite of sensitive species that I can see with you know, the naked eye in the water that can tell me something about the water quality. Um, so some species are super sensitive to changes in temperature and salinity and other components. And so it's, it's a real sort of shorthand um, that allows us to quickly sample and see what, what conditions are like. Um, and so I'll, I'll share this out um, so that you can see. But sometimes in communications, the best thing you can do is get out of the way and let the experts talk. And this is a great example of that. So with that, I am going to wrap up here and really try to leave some time for your questions. There's so much that we do that I didn't cover. Uh, but we certainly have a lot of communications resources. You can sign up for our different newsletters on different topics. You can come to our meetings. They're all open to the public. You can speak your mind on any issue that involves water resources at each quarterly business meeting. At the conclusion of the business meeting, there's a chance for the public to provide open comments. And so all you need to do is sign up to speak and log on to the Zoom if it's a remote meeting and, and you get a few minutes to, to share your thoughts on whatever issue you may, you may want to share about. And then finally, the Our Shared Waters resources are here. The website, as I mentioned, our Facebook community, which is growing and thriving, and our, our Shared Waters handle for Facebook. So with that, I'll um, stop sharing my screen and see if folks have any questions. Yeah, if you'd like, Beth, I will read questions as they come into Q&A. So we do have a question from Claire. Uh, there's been a lot of flooding lately, especially near where I live in Percocy, PA. I'm wondering whether the DRBC has some insight into why. Sure, that's a really great question. So flooding is always something that's concerning when it happens in communities. It can be so devastating, whether a home is flooded or a business or, or just a, a, or, or a roadway or, or other structure. Um, we are seeing storms of greater intensity. Um, Storms are becoming what's called flashier, right? Flash leading to flash flooding. Um, a larger volume of rain is falling in a shorter amount of time. And scientists feel that that is a, a result of a changing climate, that those weather patterns are changing. Um, what we're seeing as well is that, you know, there's more flooding that's what's called sunny day flooding, right? That it can really be something that comes in and it's not part of a hurricane you know, or it's not part of a real, you know, multi-day deluge of rain, that it, it can really happen in an instant. And I think, unfortunately, that is the trend um, that is continuing. One of the projects that I'm really proud that the DRBC was working on over this last year is working with 
local communities to provide some of the basic resources to tap into federal funding from the Federal Emergency Management Agency that is set up to alleviate and address repetitive flooding and um, flood mitigation efforts. And so in a township where, you know, there might be one person on staff who may or may not be an engineer to understand like, is there an intersection that's constantly flooding or, you know, is there a neighborhood that was built when we didn't know about floodplains as much as we do now, but, you know, now those homes have been flooded multiple times. What can we do about it? Can we elevate the homes? Can we buy those homes out? Can we do another type of a watershed project that could, you know, address some of the flooding? So there are definitely um, a lot of concerns from communities and a lot of need in communities that haven't yet been addressed. Um, but in your local community, every county has a hazard mitigation plan, and that's an emergency document. But but really, this is a again one of these like overlaps between emergency planning and natural resources, where um, you know when when a flood comes or a flood hazard is identified, um, you know there's there's a a whole a whole host of resources that can be um, that can be called upon to to address that, whether it's through, you know, infrastructure changes or um, or or providing resources for homeowners to, you know, to either change their home elevation or or move. So, yeah, it's it's concerning for sure. I have a question, Beth. Um... And so given that you're, you're dealing with 2,000 tributaries associated with the, with the river itself, is there any mechanism for evaluating each of those tributaries as to whether they're in good quality, whether they're in you know, okay quality, whether they're poor, and whether there's prioritization of like these funds from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that may increase uh, tree cover and habitat quality along those tributaries because they obviously have a major impact on the water quality and, and the, the quality of life uh, along those tributaries and, and for the river itself as well. Yes, that's a really great question. So um, in general, our agency has focused more on the main stem river than on the tributaries. But in terms of water quality, you know, every stream is supposed to be assessed under the Clean Water Act. And, you know, there's a certain amount of a regulatory process for identifying which streams sort of meet the, the use that they are designated for and which streams are impaired. So that's just one sort of way to look at it, to say, you know, we've assigned this stream to a category and is it succeeding in that category or failing, right? Um, but I think you may be talking a little bit more about, you know, what's the overall health of that ecosystem, right? So you can look at the stream and the water quality as like one specific component of the overall ecosystem health. And so I may have a stream that today has high water quality, but I can see through a visual assessment or otherwise that it has a lot of erosion. And so maybe it's only a matter of time before that stream ultimately has lower or more impaired water quality. And so, you know, uh, a, you know, a local organization I'm thinking about, you know, there's a ton of great resources at the local level through the Penn State Extension has like a master watershed um, program where, you know, local volunteers go out and they can look at their local stream banks and see if they're eroded or at a, at a larger scale, you know, a watershed organization, a property owner can apply to this grant program and say, 
this is, you know, the five miles of this of this stream or this river that I'm going to restore. And I'm going to do it because, you know, I see erosion, I see the floodplain is disconnected from the stream, and I'm going to plant this many trees and, and all of that. So yeah, that that's a tool in the toolbox for sure. And at the state level as well, there are a lot of grant programs that are designed to kind of put those projects on the ground. Yeah, certainly calls out for the public to actually get involved in stream cleanups, like what the Heritage Conservancy does, and I'm sure that Definitely. Mary Jo is also involved with, with cleanups, and also for becoming citizen science projects, like monitoring what's happening with the, the environment in your particular area, so we can all I get involved. that's right. Yeah, so there's gonna... so many ways to do that. And and I'll say, you know, the stream cleanup thing is such an interesting one. I used to think it was just an aesthetic issue, right? It was just, oh, my stream will look prettier if I clean up the trash. And honestly, like it was an it was a learning journey for me to really understand like micro the the role of of trash and microplastics, you know, sort of breaking down and and becoming this contaminant right in the environment that's harming not just, you know, not just aquatic life, but but also potentially birds and other, you know, maybe even us, right? The the science is still developing there. So yes, get involved, tell your policymakers what you think about the state of of the environment and and you know, take action, whether it's physical action or, you know, policy action, there's there's lots of ways to to make a difference. Before I jump to these next two questions, that just reminds me, vote, actually make your voice heard, contact your legislators, tell them what you value. They're not going to know Absolutely. unless you say so. Absolutely. So we've, yep. we've got another question from Claire. Uh, is our river suffering more from microplastic pollution since it is one of the oldest, longest used in the country? Or are we doing relatively well since we've had the DRBC um, for 10 plus years longer? Yeah, I would love to say we're doing well because of the DRBC, but unfortunately, it's just the nature of the beast, right? This is a new problem because plastics are relatively new in our, you know, overall history of, of human human existence. Um, and and it's not something that science has really well understood, right? It's still so before we can manage it, we have to understand it. And I think that's an example of so much of what we do at DRBC. So if you check back with me in 30 years, 20 years on this question, maybe I can say, yes, we've handled it, or we, you know, we have a plan in place where we are handling it. That's what we did with PCBs, right? It's not solved yet, but it's on its way and it's becoming a solvable problem through science research, data collection, understanding, regulation, management. And so this is the, the latest iteration of a challenge. And, and challenges are just, you know, they keep coming. And I think that's part of why, you know, our organization, our, our commission has been so vital is because we haven't solved all the problems, right? The, the problems continue to, to, to show up in new and different ways. And we've got one last question before I turn it back over to Shannon and Mary Jo for maybe some closing remarks. Uh, but this is from Eric. Uh, is there, and you've kind of mentioned this already, is there any work being done right now to remove PCBs, PFAS, and other contaminants? Sure. So um, PCBs, yes. There's a, um, there's a plan in place for loading and to sort of manage and minimize loading from known sources. PCBs themselves have been illegal. They've been banned for some time, but they're so persistent in the environment that it is a legacy of, you know, of their entry into the into the system that we're still dealing with today. PFAS is much newer and much, you know, still being understood, but at the federal level, there's a very recent call to regulate and provide um, some more guidance on what's okay, what people have to do, and that's very much a developing area. So stay tuned on that. 
So we've reached our, our time limit here, uh, but Shannon, Mary Jo, do you have any closing questions or comments? You know, I just wanted to, to say thank you, you know, Beth, for, for the presentation and, and Reg and DelVal for pulling us all together and, you know, not only making our voices heard through voting and writing to legislators, but, you know, for those of us that, you know, are have the abilities to put our dollars in the places that are, you know, can make an impact too. We can make some decisions in our purchasing power, right? So if plastics are one of our concerns in the environment, exploring alternatives that we can purchase that might not have as much of an environmental impact, or at least not as long lasting. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, as, as Beth noted, there's always new challenges and new complications, but, um, you know, starting with our individual actions and then, you know, using your voice in other ways and telling other people who just simply may not have thought about it or, um, you know, explored even what it, what they could do about it. If they're big, grand issues and trying to have that hope for those smaller steps we can take is really important. Absolutely. I also want to thank all of the partners here and all of our, our Shared Waters partners for helping us do this work and, and for, for being good stewards of the local environment, the birds, the future generations of scientists that will someday work for the DRBCs and the EPAs and the state agencies in our in our country and beyond. I'd also, like to say, yeah. I'd just also like to say thank you so much, Beth. This is wonderful. And, and thank you for, Reg, for inviting us to be part of this. I think that there are lots of opportunities for citizen science uh, so that, I mean, we have um, a community science um, committee and I'm sure there are lots of other organizations that if you visit um, our website, it's www.bcas.org, uh, but there are many, many organizations out there where um, individuals, just, you know, someone going out in their backyard uh, can contribute to the collection of data. Um, and as I said in the beginning, the Honey Hollow Inventory Project is a really great example. We have a lot of citizen scientists who are contributing to that data collection. Great. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you, Shannon, for co-sponsoring this event. And Beth, incredible presentation. Uh, I think it's always amazing to see what's right in our own backyard. I don't think people quite understand how spectacular the Delaware River is and what a treasure it is to the entire nation. Thank you so much for tonight. And uh, I hope that many of you who are on here will think about doing some citizen science. We'll think about doing some volunteering for your, your organizations, particularly these two, uh, but for others as well. I hope all of you have a great evening and that you'll join us for future One Health seminars. Um, we've got one coming up on November 1st. Elizabeth Bennett from uh, Wildlife Conservation Society talking about wildlife trafficking. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Beth. Good night, Shannon. Good night, Reg. Take care. <laughs>